today on The John Ickerberg Show, how does Jesus expect those who believe in him to live their lives? Maybe it's about every single one of us doing what Jesus did, taking a few people, showing them how to follow Christ in a way that they'll be able to take a few people and do the same in others' lives. And so the reason I'm so passionate about discipleship, John, is because I'm the product of discipleship. So, so when I met David, I had just gotten off of $180 a day heroin and cocaine addiction uh, for about six months. Well, this, these two guys, Frank and Richard, came to see me, and they were both in their early 70s. And they said, we want to change our church. And then one of them, Dick, he says, the problem is I can't remember a lot because I have the early onset of Alzheimer's. But the other guy, Frank, had a clipboard. And he was writing everything down. And these seven or eight men I worked with, now they have over a hundred men. My three guests will answer the question, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Are Dr. David Platt, who pastored the church at Brook Hills and became known as the youngest megachurch pastor in America. He is now president of the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. He is the author of seven books, including Radical, Taking Back Your Faith from the American Dream, Second is Dr. Robbie Gallaty, who was radically saved out of a life of drug addiction. Went to seminary, authored seven books on discipleship, including Growing Up and Firmly Planted, and is now the pastor of the second largest church in Tennessee, Long Hollow Baptist Church. Third is Bill Hull, pastor, teacher, and author of 20 books, including The Disciple-Making Pastor, and the disciple-making church. I began today by asking David Platt how he went from being a professor at New Orleans Seminary to being the youngest megachurch pastor in America. Listen. David, I wanna start with you. You were a seminary professor. You had a church of 150, and then all of a sudden, a megachurch calls you to be their pastor. And here you are, and you accepted it with your eyes open. You went and said yes. And when you got there, God was working in your life. Tell me some of the thoughts as you went into Brook Hill. Well, let me assure you, I'm way in over my head. Was then and am now. But, you know, God was doing some things. I was, I was teaching, like you said, as a professor in New Orleans and, and was actually not even pastoring this particular church, just serving on staff and was just front lines involved in disciple making in New Orleans. That's actually where I met Robbie and even was exposed to Bill Hall's book, The Disciple Making Pastor. I mean, as soon as you mentioned that, I just remember reading that, living in New Orleans. That's a well-worn book in my library. And so the Lord just laying foundations for what it means to make disciples uh, just on the front lines and use my life toward that end. And all of a sudden, this church uh, that's a much larger church starts talking about pastoring and I think they're crazy. I'm crazy for even thinking about stepping into this role. But I, I ended up, the Lord leading me to that church. And when I got there, in the eyes of the world, even the church world, I was, it's like I was living the dream. I mean, large crowds, just, I mean, just so much that, that I was now in charge of leading. But I had this sinking feeling inside that I was, I was missing the point. I mean, I, I open up the Bible and I see that my model in ministry and whenever the crowd started getting big, he'd say something pretty extreme and most of the crowds would leave. And when he came to the end of his time on earth, there's 120 people in Acts chapter 1. I mean, from all, from all of our measures of success today, that would look like failure. I mean, 120 people, this is the greatest, what even some secular scholars would call it, the greatest religious teacher in the history of the world. And he's got 120 people to show for it at the end. I mean, Jesus was not a pastor of a megachurch. I mean, this was mini church at best. And, and yet there was genius to what he was doing. So what did you, what did you start to say to your church? What happened? Well, I started saying maybe it's not about bringing as many crowds as possible in one place. Maybe it's about every single one of us doing what Jesus did, taking a few people, showing them how to follow Christ in a way that they'll be able to take a few people and do the same in others' lives. This is how the world was revolutionized through through Jesus pouring himself into 12 men. And maybe we've got a lot to learn about how to do that in, in our church culture today. It's not dependent on all the crowds, but it's dependent on ordinary people with the extraordinary power of the Holy Spirit in them pouring the gospel into others. I wanna come back to that, but Robbie, 
you scared him one day when he was pastor of that small church by actually coming up the aisle and standing next to him and asking him a question. And I want to put on the screen a picture of your driver's license. What was this, 10 years ago? 11 years ago. 11 years ago. And if you saw this guy, 290 pounds, who had studied Brazilian jiu-jitsu and was a bouncer in a bar in New Orleans. If you were the pastor, well, actually, let's ask you, what, how did you feel, David, when you saw Robbie coming up the aisle? Well, you see that guy coming, you, you do whatever he wants you to do at that point. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, just, you, you just get to know, and I, yeah, I was overwhelmed as I began to talk with this guy and he began to share his story with me. Matthew 28, 19, 20, 21, what are those verses? Then I want to ask you a question. Yeah, Jesus said, all authority in verse 18 has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And then Jesus ends with that last challenge, that last encouragement to us, I'll be with you to the end of the ages. And so the reason I'm so passionate about discipleship, John, is because I'm the product of discipleship. So, so when I met David, I had just gotten off of a $180 a day heroin and cocaine addiction uh, for about six months. I had a three year bout with drugs and alcohol because of a wreck I got into in 1999. An 18 wheeler came across two lanes of traffic, rear into me, slammed my car into the guardrail, went to the doctors, they sent me home with Oxycontin, Valium, Soma, and Percocet. And mm -hmm. so here I was, a 22 year old boy, and I was in legitimate pain. And so I took the drugs every four to six hours and within three months, I was addicted to pharmaceutical drugs, got involved in street drugs, began to sell drugs. And times were good by the world standards in the beginning. I mean, we had tons of money, did what we wanted. And then uh, in the year 2000, I lost my first friend to drugs and alcohol, and then eight friends over the next uh, three years. Six went to prison. And then finally, I remembered the gospel, which I heard in college seven years before, and surrendered my life to Christ. And so when I came to the Lord, November 12, 2002, I had a radical Paul-like conversion. Uh, it was so radical, I went to my dad, who at the time was, was Roman Catholic, and I said, Dad, God's called me into the ministry. God, God's called me to preach. But I didn't really know what God was doing in my life. But for the next eight months, I just wandered. You know, I, just, I didn't know how to read the Bible. I, I really didn't know how to pray. I knew the Our Father, I knew the Hail Mary, I knew road prayers, but I didn't know how to pray. Yeah. I, I, I didn't know I should memorize scripture. And so I wandered for eight months. And then one Sunday morning at church, uh, I had been praying for about two months. God sends someone in my life. And David came across and he said, hey, hey man, would you be interested in meeting once a week, memorize scripture, we'll study the Bible and pray. And I said, I, I'd love to meet. And he said, why don't you pray about it? And I said, I'd already have. When do we start? And uh, I'm convinced David took me on as a project. <laughs> he wouldn't <laughs> say that. Because you have to understand, I mean, I was the farthest person from the Lord. I mean, you think in your mind, here's the guy that would never come to the Lord, has no interest in the gospel. And God did an amazing work in my life. And so I would say my life is a testimony of God's grace. Yeah, I love this, Robbie, because there's a lot of folks that might have those problems that are watching right now. And they want to know, what can Jesus how can he change my life? Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about how he can change your life. Mm -hmm. And people overseas might be desperate where they're at watching this and they have no Christians around and they're listening. What did Jesus tell you that changed your life? What was the gospel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I realized for the first time that when I stood before a holy God, I realized that I was a sinner and, and I desperately needed to do something about that. You know, for years I just I engaged in all the sins of the world, indulged in sins, and it really didn't mean much to me until the conviction of the Holy Spirit set in. And I realized I needed uh, salvation. And I heard about Christ, and Christ was, Christ was kind of like the tooth fairy to me as a child, you know, Santa Claus. I mean, he, he was there, but he, I don't know if he was real. And on November 12th, he became real to me. And, and I realized how much I needed him. And it wasn't just, you know, signing a card or walking an aisle. This was a radical transformation experience that I knew Jesus rose from the dead, died on the cross, uh, that he paid the penalty for my sins and that I needed him desperately. And, and I surrendered my life to him. And since that day, it's just been an amazing God story. Yeah. Bill, you influenced both of these guys by one of your 20 books or many of the 20 books. All right. And you were You've been a professor teaching at seminary. You've been a pastor for, what, 20 years. Mm -hmm. You have then led a denomination 
in the very thing these guys are talking about is that we need to obey Jesus' command to go and make disciples of all the nations. Now, you came into a denomination, a Christian denomination, and briefly, what was the challenge you were facing in talking to the pastors who were listening to you? Well, I think that the greatest challenge was the fact that they actually just gave lip service to it. They all acknowledged that making disciples was really important, but that in practice as pastors and now as maybe regional leaders of a denomination, they didn't have any real life experience. To begin with, they would say, well, I've actually never been discipled. And I would respond, yes, you have, just maybe badly or possibly in churchianity rather than what Christ taught. And so as a result, it was inviting them into my life and working with them and talking to them and then getting their trust so then I could talk to them about here's what the process is. This is really what it means to be a follower of Jesus and that we want to live our lives as though Jesus were living it. And that's what we want to communicate with other people. So it was a matter of relationship and breaking down barriers and then having them feel safe and comfortable around me and around what I wanted them to do. Hi, th this is great stuff. And folks, I want you to zero in on what they're saying, that this is for every Christian. And I can <laughs> almost hear some of you saying, not me. I'm not a seminary professor. I have, I don't know the Bible that much. Uh, I'm not sure I could talk. And Robbie, I want to come to you. You've written in your new book that we'll show on the screen right now. You have said that the gospel came to you because it was heading to someone else. Your salvation was never intended by God to be an end in itself, but a beginning. God saved you to be a conduit through whom his glorious life-changing gospel would flow to others. This is in your book, Growing Up. What did you mean? Yeah, when I read the New Testament, John, I see that even when Jesus called the disciples in the beginning, he implanted within them the seed of replication. And so I think in Christianity today, so many people look at church as an end. So Jesus called us to come and sit when actually he called us to go and serve. And I see that in Mark chapter one, verse 17. If you remember, Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee, he sees some fishermen out there and he says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And within that call, we see a threefold strategy, in essence, a threefold outline for what it means to be a disciple. The first thing is a disciple follows Jesus, come follow me. Not following a church or a system or a religion or a denomination, we're following Christ. The second thing we see is a disciple is formed by Jesus. Come follow me and I will make you. Jesus is the one, the sanctifying work of the gospel in a person's life is Christ works in you so that you can serve other people. And then the final aspect, which I think is the one that's often looked over and overlooked, is that a disciple focuses on others. So the Christian life is not just about us, our lives being, being, ha having a ticket into heaven, so to speak, to be transported into the spiritual by and by, like so many Christians think, is not the end of the Christian life or the goal of the Christian life, although that's a byproduct, praise God for that. Mm -hmm but that God calls us, He forms us, and then we're supposed to be focused on other people. And so for me, discipleship without replication is not discipleship, true discipleship. Yeah, David, you know, I was reading your book and you said that when Jesus calls us to Himself and we put our faith in Him, one of the first evidences is that He calls you to be fishers of men. Mm -hmm. And I can remember the reason that I'm here doing this TV program for 33 years is not because I went to get all my graduate degrees and doctorate. It happened way back when, when I was in high school. And somebody said, Jesus wants you to go and make disciples. He wants you, Ankerberg, to share your faith with your friends. Mm -hmm. And I said, Jesus, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's how I started, but that decision to follow Jesus at that point and share my faith with other people led all the way to here. For you, what was it for you? A very similar story that 
I mean, from the very beginning, I had people in my life that were telling me to be a disciple is to make disciples, that we can't disconnect these two things. The gospel is not intended to stop with any one of us. It's intended to spread through every one of us. And so, and to see that play out, and to see that play out in Robbie's life. I remember when I met him, he's come to Christ, and he's, he's sharing the gospel. He's got so much to learn, had so much to learn. But he's sharing the God. Did I emphasize that enough? Thank you. <laughs> so much to learn. But he is sharing what he knows with the guys that God has put in his sphere of influence immediately. And I think about places, even where I've, where I've been around the world, even places where persecution is a, a reality for people who, who will be sharing the gospel with other people around him. And I have a friend who, who lived in one particular context. And whenever somebody came to Christ in this context, the first thing they would do, first thing, this would be the initial step of discipleship, would would have that person make a list of all the people they know and then circle on that list the 10 people who were least likely to kill them if they tried to share the gospel with them. <laughs> and they would say, start with those people. Mm -hmm. And so this wasn't, okay, we'll wait until you get to a certain level of maturity before you start sharing the gospel with others. No, this is the, this is the overflow. You have, you have a relationship with Christ. You want others to know. And so we encourage Every member in the church that I pastor, all right, you've all got the gospel. You don't have to wait until a certain arrival point in your spiritual life. You've got people that God's put in your sphere of influence right now who don't know Christ. So how can you be intentional right now about sharing the gospel with them? Bill, what do you say to people that uh, say, I haven't got enough knowledge of the Bible to even share my faith. I'd be scared to do it. I'm not a good talker. What do you say to those folks? Well, I have a friend named Dennis. Dennis happens to be a judge. And he, when he first uh, became a Christian, he went into the courtroom and he had a little prayer just at the table, at the council table. He said, uh, Lord, I'd really appreciate it, you know, that I, I love you and I know you love me, but I would be, just be cool if you just stay out of this. Because he thought he had it, you know, he, had, he knew what to do as a judge. But then he learned that he needed a little bit more than that. And so he actually believed, he heard that all he had to do was make disciples, and he was a disciple. So he and his wife started reading a book about discipleship in their living room, and they read it every Tuesday night together and talk about it. Then they decided to have five of their friends come over, and those five friends came over and they took them through that same thing. He started writing curriculum. At the same time, he's going through chemotherapy. He is uh, uh, working in the courtroom. Over the next three years, over 175 people went through this process that he was developing. And I visited him in East Texas. And it was like this, the most energy, the most love, uh, the most enthusiastic group I'd met in a very long time, just because of one guy who dared say, okay, I'm gonna make disciples because I cannot not do that. I have to do it. Robbie. Your buddy here that mentored you said, God wants to take ordinary people and do extraordinary things because he's given you the Holy Spirit, okay? And there are what I call ordinary Christians, never been to seminary, but they love the Lord. They don't realize how much love is coming out of them. If they ever shared that with somebody, they would be amazed at what, how would Jesus would use them. How could you encourage them right now? This is for every Christian. Yeah, I, I just want to piggyback what David said because it brought me back to our first meeting. And one of the things David instructed me on early on was the very root of the word disciple. So, so disciple in the New Testament is found 238 times in the Gospels, 269 times in the New Testament. The word Christians found three times, two of those times according to Harper's Dictionary is in a negative tense, a derogatory term, if you will. So at the very root, the word disciple is a learner. And I remember early on, uh, David would say, you're not learning for yourself, you're learning for the next guy. And so, and so ways I believe people can get started is first of all, before you can make disciples, you have to be a disciple. So I challenge our people or even pastors or leaders in the ministry, you should never listen to a sermon or watch a program or, or, or read a, a book without taking notes. Because how else will you pass on what you've learned? I mean, we, we forget it in, in just moments after we hear something. And I've always remembered that, that and, and I would sit with David, he could tell you, I, uh, sometimes I'd forget my notebook and so I'd take napkins from Mr. Wang's or, or, or the Italian place, <laughs> yeah, and, right. uh, yeah. this stack of napkins. And, mm. Yeah, he'd write down everything. But, and that was the beauty. I knew that 
everything that I was passing on to him from the Word was not stopping with him. It was spreading through him. And there was a whole sphere of influence, a whole group of guys that, that I didn't know, that I would never rub shoulders with just because we're in different, I mean, we, we're not, I'm not in relationship, friendship with those guys, but that Robbie is in friendship with. And that, when I think about the church as a whole, even the church that I pastor, they're going into places I'll never go. Mm -hmm. And if they're going into those places, with the gospel and trust in the gospel and share it as they go. And you can't stop the spread of the gospel when it's happening like that. One final word. The people that are listening right now that have heard this program, what do you want them to walk away with? How can you encourage them? My encouragement would be, if number one, if they don't know Christ, to trust in Christ, to, to see, just like Robbie shared, their, their need for Christ. His beauty, His life, His death, His resurrection that makes Him totally unique on the landscape of human history and trust in Him to reconcile you to God. And then once you have, and for all who have, this, good, this news is too good to keep to ourselves. And you have everything you need in the gospel and the power of God's Spirit to make it known to others. Now folks, did you pick up on the phrase that impacted Robbie Gallaty's life? It was the phrase, the gospel came to you because it was heading to someone else. Your salvation was never intended by God to be an end in itself, but a beginning. God saved you to be a conduit through whom His glorious, life-changing gospel would flow to others. If you're a Christian, my question to you today is this, has the gospel stopped with you? Or have you been continually sharing Christ with those around you? Maybe God is speaking to you right now and asking you if you will surrender yourself to Him and let Him use you any way that He wants. You know, Jesus commanded every one of us as Christians, no matter who we are or what kind of job we have, to share Him with others. Now, next week, we're going to talk more about this. But today, if you would like to have all four TV programs with Dr. David Platt, Dr. Robbie Gallaty, and Bill Hull entitled, Are You a Disciple of Jesus? and they're available on DVD for a gift of $49. You may order the four programs in the series right now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. Then as we close today, please remember that there are 2.8 billion people overseas that have never even heard about Jesus. There are 4,000 languages in the world that have no Bible. Further, 50 to 75% of the people in the world cannot read their own language. They are functionally illiterate. So they need an audio Bible in their own language to listen about Jesus. Now, last year I asked for your help and you provided enough audio Bibles so that today 668,020 people are in listening groups each week in 35 different countries listening to the Bible in one of 75 languages. In these listening groups, they come to faith in Christ, and then they take the gospel to the next village. Our goal this year is to provide enough audio Bibles so that one million more people can listen to the Bible in their own language. Could I ask you to prayerfully help me accomplish this? If you will, there are five ways you can do this. First, if you'll give a gift of just $30, a special pre-programmed micro SD card will be donated on your behalf to a pastor or Christian worker overseas. Now, what is a micro SD card? It's an ultra small flash memory card about the size of the tip of your finger. But it's important. People in the poorest countries have old mobile phones that are not connected to the internet. But when these micro SD cards are given to them and inserted into their phones, they instantly can hear the Word of God in their own language for the very first time. The micro SD card in their phone becomes the only Bible these people have for learning, for church services, for evangelism, for everything. And you can provide it for a gift of only $30. Second, if you'll give a gift of $100, you can provide two things. First, a very special micro SD card for a Christian worker's phone. And second, you can provide a Bible stick containing the New Testament Psalms for one of 65.3 million people who are in refugee camps today. And then those of you who give a gift of $100 or more, we will send you all four TV programs in our series, Are You a Disciple of Jesus? on DVD, absolutely free. Then third, for a gift of $500, a very special audio proclaimer, 
will be donated on your behalf to one of two million pastors who right now do not have a Bible in their language for themselves or for their church. The audio proclaimer comes pre-programmed with one of 1,120 languages. It has solar panels that can recharge the batteries 3,000 times. And if it's cloudy, it has a hand crank that they can crank for 10 minutes and listen to it for 40 minutes. It also comes with a very special loudspeaker system so that more than 1,000 people can hear the Bible clearly. You know, folks, entire churches are started by one audio proclaimer. In addition, we'll also send you today's series on DVD, Are You a Disciple of Jesus? And then fourth, if you'll give a gift of $1,000, three micro SD cards, three Bible sticks, and one audio proclaimer will be donated on your behalf to Christians who right now desperately want to hear God's Word. Your gifts will also help us support our presentation and defense of the gospel on TV here and overseas, and we'll send you today's TV series on DVD. And then finally, would you like to do something very special? For a gift of $5,000, you can fund the audio recording of one entire chapter of the New Testament where right now none exists. It will probably be the only translation of that chapter of the Bible that a people group will ever have. If you will help provide one of these audio Bibles on one of these audio devices today, would you please take a moment and call us right now at 1-800-805. 3030. That's 1 800 805 3030. Or if you wish, you may go to our website at jashow.org where we have a secure place for you to give your gift. And when we receive your gift, we'll send you a receipt and a commemorative certificate thanking you for your gift. Our phone number again is 1 800 805 3030. And folks, I'll appreciate your help today very much.